Hello everyone, welcome to What If Deku Has the Ability of Blacklight Virus Prototype Part 8. Before we start please go support Dummy wearing a hoodie for writing that awesome fanfic, now let's begin. Chapter 25. Little White Blessing. So let me get this straight, as always started. Instead of retreating and asking for a pro hero's help, you took matters into your own hands and killed a villain. He asked in a disapproving tone. He just got news of Izuku arriving at UA and bringing two unconscious girls. It wouldn't be that big of a deal for him, since he trusts the boy to make a logical choice. But hearing that the boy had killed a villain didn't go well for the hero. The hero's words didn't faze Izuku, who kept his eyes on the two girls on the hospital beds. Either kill him, or he'll kill me and the other girl, then continue his experiments on Eerie. I had no other choice. He said nonchalantly, not even looking at the man. Azawa just looked at him incredulously. What do you mean you have no other choice? You could have called out for any nearby heroes too. He was cut off when Izuku spoke up again. We are nowhere near any heroes or police officers. I checked the area using my thermal vision while I was talking to him. No one was there to help me. He said as he looked over at the man. And besides, he deserved to die. As he said that, the man grabbed the collar of his uniform and pulled him closer. Just because he's a villain, it doesn't mean that you had to kill him. That's not what heroes do, Midoriya, he said, gritting his teeth. It just makes you know better than him. He said, activating his quirk to prove a point. But Izuku wasn't phased by this. I don't give a damn he said to the man, who was surprised by his loud voice. I saw everything that he had done to Eerie through his memories, and let me tell you something. He didn't regret all the heinous actions that he'd done to Eerie and all of the victims he came across. The boy growled in anger. Azawa was about to retort when a cry echoed in the room. Don't hurt me I'll be good, please the two males in the room looked over in the direction of the voice and saw Eerie sitting up on the bed, crying and covering her head as the little girl repeated every word. Her horn began glowing uncontrollably as the little girl clutched her head. Please don't hurt me, Iri Izuku said as he ran towards the little girl's side, somehow escaping as always grasp with ease. As he arrived at Iri's side, he erased her quirk using erasure and hugged the girl, who sank into his arms and sobbed uncontrollably. SHHH. It's okay, Iri. The bad man won't hurt you anymore. Izuku whispered to the little girl's ear as the boy hugged her tightly while caressing her white locks, a move that made the little girl calm down a bit before she fell asleep in his arms. Careful not to wake her up, Izuku gently placed the sleeping girl on the bed. Azawa was staring at the little girl when Izuku's voice called out to him. Is that enough as proof, Mr. Azawa? Or do you want more? Izuku asked in a cold voice. I believe that is more than enough proof, Mr. Midoriya. The voice of the principal spoke up as the door opened. Nezu entered the room, an uncharacteristic seriousness radiating from the chimera. I am happy that you chose to do what you did, rather than letting that villain escape. Izuku was taken aback by the way Nezu is talking. It seems like he can somehow sympathize with Eerie's situation. Though filled with confusion and shock, Izuku smiled at the chimera and bowed in thanks. Nezu waved him off and approached the bed. Reaching the bed, Nezu climbed a chair, reached out his hand paw to the sleeping little girl, and caressed her hair with a sad smile on his face. For someone so young, you have gone through things unimaginable. Poor child. Retracting his arm paw from the little girl's hair and sighed. Looks like the dorm system is going to be needed after all. He whispered, but Izuku heard it. Dorm system? He asked, eyebrows raised in curiosity. Nezu nodded. Yes. The staff and I discussed the introduction of a dorm system after the USJ incident had happened, but had to dismiss it due to the paperwork given by the sports festival and the internships we had to postpone it. He said before looking at Eerie and back to Izuku. I'm pretty sure Eerie might need a place to stay. Though your home is an option, it would be risky not only for Eerie, but also for your mother to be in the same place. They will become a target if ever the other Yakuza group members would find them. Azawa finished, making Nezu nod. Azawa pinched the bridge of his nose. I don't get paid for this shit. He grumbled. Nezu chucked and looked over at Izuku. Not only that. The dorm system will serve for those students exposed to high-ranking villains and incidents, such as you, Todoroki, Anita and the Hosu incident, and the hero killer's capture. Which reminds me he paused before looking over at Izuku with a smile. Congratulations on ranking 35th Izuku Midoriya. This made Izuku blink in confusion. Before he could ask what he meant by that, Azawa pushed his phone out in front of Izuku. The boy was surprised by the sudden action, but snapped out of it when he saw what was on the phone, which made his eyes grow wide. Izuku Blackwatch Midoriya, a UA Hero Corps student, voted to be ranked 35th in the Hero Billboard chart JP after successfully capturing the hero killer. Staying and saving 27 civilians during his internship with Mirko, making him the first hero student to rank this high. Izuku was gaping like a fish out of water. If it weren't for Eerie being in his arms he would have fallen down to the floor, unconscious. 
The idea of him becoming a high-ranking hero was his dream, but for it to happen in just a short time, and in his internship nonetheless, made it quite overwhelming for the Blacklight user. He reread the news article once again and noticed the date. WW wait this was made a day after Stain was captured. How am I just knowing about this? He asked in an exasperated tone. Oh that? It was Mirko's idea. She said it would be a good surprise when you returned to UA. Nezu said, chuckling at the boy's twitching eye. Sighing in exasperation, he spoke up. Also, how can I rank this high if I still don't have a license he was cut off when Nezu showed him a card. Looking at it, Izuku was shocked to see what it was. A hero license a hero license with his name and picture on it, his own hero license. He shakily took it from Nezu's hand paw and inspected it. Provisional hero license. Name. Izuku Midoriya. Agency. UA High School. Grade. First year, class 1A. Issued. XX, XX 20 XX. Quirk. Blacklight. Hero name. Blackwatch temporary. But the unanimous decision votes of the top 10 heroes and the Hero Public Safety Commissions, deeming you worthy due to your heroic actions not only in Hosu, but also when you helped Todoroki remember why he wanted to become a hero. You are now officially a hero. Nezu said as he extended his arm paw to the boy. You can now be called out to the field whenever someone needs assistance. On behalf of the UA staff, I congratulate you, Izuku Midoriya. Izuku was snapped out of his stupor when a tear fell down the license. He didn't realize that he was crying. Izuku sniffed and wiped off the tears in his eyes. Smiling at the chimera, Izuku shook hands paw with Nezu. Thank you sir. I'll do my best. In the corner of the room, Azawa was smiling under his scarf. It's been so long since he first met Izuku in that warehouse practicing his quirk and telling him his story, dream, and his quirk. He wouldn't admit it, but he sees Izuku as his favorite student, maybe even a son that he never had. Albeit, a troublesome one that is. Nonetheless, he is proud that one of his students had achieved their dream to become a hero. One down, 19 more to go. He thought. As Nezu and Izuku stopped their handshake, the chimera's expression changed to seriousness. Now that that's out of the way, let's get back to Tapa clearing his throat, Nezu continued. The staff had all voted for the dorm system to be made official after the final exams. But because of the Hosu incident and your early hero induction, we will be forced to make the dorm system official a week before the final exams. Izuku was about to talk when Nezu talked again. In spite of the dorm system being made official for the students and Little Eerie's safety, there is one problem. Nezu said as he turned his head towards the other girl lying unconscious on the bed. Turns out, this girl is called Himiko Toga. The same one that killed more than 15 people due to stabbing and blood drainage. Nezu sighed at this and spoke up once again. It was even speculated that she was the person to have killed her classmates by sucking his blood using a straw, but we have no proof of that. Izuku's eyes widen like plates. This girl, Himiko Toga, is a villain. A murderer. A serial killer. Then why did she save Eerie? Why would she protect someone if she could just kill her? Somehow answering his inner questions, it appears to be that her actions of saving young Eerie has one reason. Nezu said before pointing to Izuku. I believe she had done it because of you. Linking once twice thrice Izuku then pointed at himself. Me? Nezu nodded, making Izuku widen his eyes. But I never met her before. This is the first time that I've seen her. Izuku protested. I know. Nezu chuckled at the boy. But that doesn't mean that you don't have an impact on her actions. What do you mean? Izuku asked. We have been tracking her down for a year now. It was until the day of the sports festival where we found her. He paused to drink tea that somehow appeared in his hand. The information I got said that she was last seen looking over at television in Yokohama during the sports festival. At first she was looking at the television with a twisted, hungry expression on her face, but as soon as you appeared on the screen her whole demeanor flipped. Izuku remained silent, a way for him to tell Nezu to go on. As soon as she saw your face, her expression changed to full 180. Her twisted expression broke into longing and guilt. She also mentioned someone called Sato as she cried in front of the television. Sato? Who's that? Azawa asked. Nezu could only shrug. No clue. He began walking to the door. But whoever he is, she sees him and you young Midoriya. I'm not sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but let's just hope that it's the former. He said as he exited the room followed by Azawa, leaving Izuku to wonder as he looked over at Himiko Toga's sleeping form, as a question came to his mind. Buseito to you, Himiko Toga. Itsuki Bakugo lay down on his bed as a tired sigh escaped his mouth. Finally, his internship was finished. It was exhausting and somewhat enjoyable to say the least. During his internship with Best Genist, Kitsuki had gone through anger management sessions and extra heroic rules and regulations with the pro hero. And he's gotta admit, as boring as all those sessions were he could feel himself change a bit. Maybe because he genuinely wants to change.
It felt strange when the hero gave him advice on doing some meditation and breathing techniques to calm himself in tough situations. In patrols, in spite of the annoyance he got when Best Genus just gave autographs and waved at his fans, he would admit having someone who genuinely likes you is heartwarming to the blonde boy, as he remembered a girl he met during one of their patrols. The girl was from Shiketsu High and has a weird habit of using slang words, but quite frankly, he kinda thinks it's cute. She was interning under crust. Though their conversation was awkward at first, since it's the first time Katsuki talked to a girl that actually admires him due to the girl, who introduced herself as Kami Atsushimi, saying that she saw him from the sports festival and was rooting for him to win the whole thing. She even said that he was totes dope in his match against Izuku. Statement that made Katsuki blush for the first time in his life. At the end of the day, Katsuki and Kami exchanged digits. The fact that Katsuki genuinely smiled at that moment made best genus note his improvement. Taking out his phone to check for any messages from Kami, he noticed a notification from a news article. He was about to swipe it away when he accidentally clicked it. The article consists of Izuku's early induction to the hero business due to his actions in Hosu, him capturing Stain and saving a lot of civilians with ease and proficiency. Katsuki blinked at this and scrolled further in the article. As he continued to read the article and saw how the HPSC and the top 10 voted for Izuku's induction, he expected himself to be angry, jealous, and maybe hunt down Izuku, but he didn't. For the first time in his lifetime, Katsuki felt happy for Izuku's success. He was a bit jealous who is he kidding. He's really jealous that Izuku got inducted as a hero before he could. Looks like I'll just have to work harder than before to catch up with you then. Congratulations, Izuku. He whispered to the screen showing Izuku's picture slicing off Anomu's wings. He sighed as he placed his phone on his nightstand. Looking up at the ceiling, he remembered all of the harsh things he had done to his former friend and had to admit all of them were unforgivable, especially when he told him to take a swan dive off a rooftop. Seriously, what was he thinking back then? Even he knows suicide baiting is a crime and he would have been sent to prison for saying that to Izuku. He was so full of himself and he hated it. Grumbling, he looked at the picture frame on his nightstand. The picture was shot a year before they ever got their quirks. It was taken before he had begun bullying and hurting Izuku. Now that he thinks about it, did he ever apologize to him? Has he even looked Izuku in the eyes to talk to him? Has the two of them ever talked to each to clear out some of their past quarrels? The answer? No, they haven't. They never tried to clear out the misunderstandings and faults they had in their relationship. Feeling like a complete idiot, Katsuki vowed to apologize to Izuku as soon as he came back to UA. For now, he needs to sleep. The sigh escaped Kurijiri's mouth as he swept the dust that was used to be a tablet. Tomura Shigaraki wasn't quite happy when he showed him the article regarding Izuku Midoriya's early hero induction, to the point that he disintegrated the device to smithereens, before childishly stomping away to his room. Kurijiri was genuinely impressed but not surprised by the early hero induction of the boy. Izuku Midoriya, the same person to single-handedly stop the Nomu from their USJ attack. As he remembered the boy's face, a sudden feeling of hope crawled through his chest. Izuku Midoriya maybe just maybe, you're the one to save me from my misery. Achuo Izuku sneezed as he was making his way to UA, surprising all the people passing by. Sniffing, he was confused. He was literally immune to any diseases, so he couldn't catch a cold. Someone must have been thinking about me. He thought as he shrugged it off. He was on his way to UA to make sure that Iri was okay and healthy. He would have stayed by her side yesterday if it weren't for recovery girl's shock absorption penetrating Kane and her telling him to go home. Seriously, how can he be immune to punches, kicks, fire, ice, and explosions, but be vulnerable to her godforsaken cane? As he passed a corner, Izuku bumped into something, or someone. Uchi. A small cheery voice said, making Izuku look down. As he looked down, he saw the familiar brown bob cut hair. Chaco. No wait, she texted me that she won't be heading to UA today. So this is blinking, Izuku took a while before he recognized Kanoko Komori. Komori. Said girl, looked up and widened her eyes. M. Midoriya she stared at the 1A class representative and had to suppress a squeal when she noticed Izuku's new haircut. Holy shiitake he's so handsome her thoughts as a blush spread on her cheeks. Not noticing the blush on the girl's cheeks, Izuku smiled sheepishly. Sorry about that, Komori. I wasn't looking. Here let me help you up. He extended his arm to the girl, which she took timidly. The uh. T thanks she said as she was pulled up from the ground. Careful to not show the blush covering her cheeks. It had been a few months since she got this close to Izuku, and it makes her heart flutter that he is still the same caring boy that helped her gain a bit of confidence after the USJ attack. Smiling at the girl, Izuku tilted his head. So, are you heading to UA too? He asked the mushroom girl. Tamori nodded timidly as she walked side by side Izuku. Why yeah. I need to give the internship report to Principal Nezu. She said, making Izuku nod at her words. 
By the way, who did you intern for, Midoriya? I interned for Mirko, since she sent me an internship request and a high-ranking hero. Izuku said, suppressing a blush as he remembered the heated kiss he and the heroine shared. How about you? Who did you intern for? Oh oh I interned for Backdraft. She said, smiling at the boy. He also sent an internship request to me. Nodding at her, Izuku spoke up. I see. Looks like he saw potential in you. Why yeah? Maybe. She whispered, before looking straight to the road. Seeing Yue up ahead, she continued to walk. As they continued walking towards Yue, an awkward silence filled the air. Izuku to himself felt something off with Komori, beside the part that he is fully aware that she likes him. Unable to keep his curiosity, he looked over at the girl and stared at her. Feeling the boy stare, Komori couldn't help but turn crimson. I eyes s something on my face, Midoriya. She stuttered out. Completely avoiding eye contact. Not hearing a response from the boy made her nervous. Komori, did you perhaps cut your hair? Izuku asked out of nowhere. The question made the girl's eyes widen in shock. She only cut her hair a few inches, making it look similar in length with Yuraka's hair. In spite of the fact that her hair looked identical to her longer hair, not even her parents can see the difference, Izuku somehow saw that she cut her hair. Pressing her index fingers together, she nodded timidly. Yes. I d did cut my hair a few inches. How can you tell? She asked, genuinely curious to know how he knew. Oh that? I kinda remember in USJ your hair was touching your shoulders back then, unlike today. Izuku pointed at her brown hair. Hamori could only blink. How could he remember that small detail? Does he she shrugged off the delusional thought off her mind. She was about to talk again when they reached the entrance gate of UA. Well, looks like this is where we split up. See you around, Komori. Izuku said. Looking at the girl, he noticed that she looked saddened. She looks like she still wants to talk to him. Wanting to cheer her up. He took out his phone. Before we go, wanna exchange numbers. You know, so we can text each other. Seeing her expression lit up as she swiftly took out her phone, Izuku couldn't help but chuckle. After exchanging numbers, Izuku smiled at her. I'll be on my way to recovery girl now. Chat with you later also taking a step forward, Izuku touched her chin and lifted her face. Keep your chin up and be confident. You're prettier that way. He said as he removed the strand of hair blocking his left eye and placed them behind her reddening ear. I'll see you around, Kinoko. He smiled as he turned to walk towards the direction of the infirmary, failing to see the steam exploding out of Komori's ears as her face turned full tomato. Chapter 26. Himiko Toga. Izuku can be seen sitting on his seat as his classmates conversed with each other. They had congratulated him for his early hero induction as soon as he entered the classroom. Some of his classmates saw his new look, and most of them liked it, while the girls blushed at his makeover. Benyu and Shoto gave him approving nods as they made eye contact with him, the former bowing repeatedly at him as a show of gratitude for saving him which Izuku just waved off. He had just come from the nurse's office to check on Iri and Toga, who were both still asleep at that time, before heading to Nezu's office to report the result of his patrols the night before. Since he is now a hero, he can now do patrols during his free time, as long as it doesn't hinder his studies. Despite being a hero, he is still a student after all. It had been a week since he brought them there and had talked to both girls. Iri was skeptical to talk to Izuku at first due to her not having much control over her quirk and the fact that she could still remember the pain of the cruel experiments done to her by overhaul. Despite that, Izuku did his best to get the girl to open up. Which was fruitful to see her smile for the first time as he had gifted her candy apples that his mom made for some reason. Izuku promised himself to help protect Iri and her smile at all costs. Even if it meant he had to kill another villain to do just that. Amiko Toga was a different story however. Flashback, Izuku had just exited Iri's room after getting her to sleep. He smiled as he remembered the smile in her innocent face as she looked straight at him while he sang her a lullaby. It had been a week since he had saved her from overhaul, and she had changed drastically. Shyness and nervousness can still be seen in the little girl's eyes, but not as much as she used to have, while the fear and skepticism was completely changed into curiosity and genuine happiness brought by her savior. She may still have some trust issues towards the other UA staff, but it doesn't matter. Izuku is just happy that she is in good hands now. He was about to pass a corner when he suddenly heard a faint whimper. Izuku was about to run back to Iri's room when he heard it coming from the room across from Iri's room. It was coming from Toga's room. The same girl who had killed so many people. The same girl who did so many crimes. The same girl who Iri said helped her escape from overhaul. Despite all of her villainous actions, Izuku couldn't help but be grateful for her helping Iri escape. And just like Yuri had said, she had helped Yuri run away from Overhaul's grasp, even taking a spike into her torso. Hearing the whimpers became a bit louder, Izuku approached the room, despite it clearly being a villain's room. He couldn't help it. He just can't just let a person in need suffer even more, especially now that he is a hero. 
Taking the doorknob, he opened the door of the room and cautiously entered it to see Toga sitting on her bed. Sobbing into her knees. Approaching the crying girl, he called out. Hey. Toga. Are you okay? He asked as he mentally kicked himself for asking a stupid question. She is crying her eyes out, of course she's not okay. Toga visibly flinched and froze as her sobs stopped. She slowly raised her head to show Izuku her tear-filled yellow slitted eyes. He could see so many emotions in her eyes, but what stuck out to Izuku was longing. He could feel some kind of a connection between the two of them as they stared into one another's eyes. Esato? She asked as she stared at Izuku. Before Izuku could respond to her, he yelped in surprise as he was enveloped in a hug. It confused him for a second till he suddenly felt his clothes begin to feel damp. Slowly, he looked down and saw that she was crying once again while clinging tightly at the boy like a lifeline. She was saying inaudible words, but Izuku could hear some keywords coming from the girl. I'm sorry Sato. Drank your blood. Filled you. Couldn't control it. I'm sorry. She was repeating all of that as she held on to him even tighter. The green-haired boy didn't do anything to push her off of him however. He did the complete opposite. He hugged the blonde girl closer before whispering comforting words to her ear. Despite her being a villain, Izuku couldn't help but comfort a crying girl. Momo was a clear example of it. It took not a minute for the girl to stop crying and snapped out of her sobbing when she finally saw Izuku's face. Instinctively, she jumped away from Izuku, even using a scalpel as a weapon to defend herself. The sadness in her crying face now morphed into a scowl as she swung the scalpel in a stabbing position towards Izuku's shoulder. Seeing her reaction, Izuku could only give her a look of sympathy and sadness. She and Iri had experienced a lot of pain and trauma in their life. Letting the scalpel land on his shoulder, Izuku felt the pain caused by the blade stabbing into him, but he didn't show face as he looked directly at the girl's eyes. The girl was shocked to see Izuku just take the hit and didn't even show any reaction to the pain. That made her let go of the blade she was holding as she backed away from Izuku. Shaking as her eyes were widening at the blood dripping from his shoulder. Izuku could see her salivating as her cat-like eyes appeared to be dilated. Recognizing the same look from Stain after he sliced Izuku's skin, our protagonist realized what's happening. The blood-related quirk. He thought as he looked at her and at the blood of his wound, where the scalpel is still stuck, and back at her. And by the looks of her reaction, she had been deprived of her needs. Do you? Um. Do you want my blood? Izuku asked slowly, causing the girl's eyes to widen as she quickly removed her eyes from his shoulder and looked at his. See can I? Toga asked, stuttering in the process. Her eyes widened even more when the boy in front of her nodded. She hadn't expected this to happen. To be offered some blood to her was alien to her. It was the first time someone was kind enough and volunteered to give her some blood to drink. She stared at the boy to see if he was deceiving her to lower her guard, but all she could see in his green eyes was genuine concern and kindness. She was sure tears were building up in her eyes. Whispering an okay. Izuku heard the whisper and nodded at her. Sitting down on the bed in front of her, he removed the scalpel on his shoulder before he began unzipping his hoodie jacket, revealing his tank top and the wound that was beginning to heal slowly due to super regeneration. Looking up to the girl, he could still see the skeptical look in her eyes. Meeting gazes with the girl, Izuku smiled at her. Drink as much as you like. He said as he pulled down his hoodie, exposing the wound even more. Amiko could only look at Izuku and the wound that was starting to heal. Her mind was swirling, and the thirst for blood made it hard for her to comprehend what she was doing, as she unconsciously stepped closer to the boy and sat on his lap. She could hear him talking, but her focus was on the blood. Breathing heavily as her nostrils exhaled the scent of the boy's blood. It was quite arousing for her, but she ignored that feeling as she looked at Izuku's eyes and had to blush as her golden yellow met with his dark forest green. It made her heartbeat quicken for a second. It didn't take long for her to grab him by the shoulder and lower her head. As soon as the sweet coppery taste of blood met her lips and tongue, she couldn't stop herself anymore. She began drinking the sweet blood of the boy she was on top of, and it for some reasons felt good. Izuku was surprised, if not shocked, blushing while he witnessed the blonde girl sitting on his lap while sucking his blood. He had expected her to sit next to or behind him. But to have her sit on his lap while drinking his blood is quite interesting. It didn't hurt while she was sucking the blood, maybe it's a part of her quirk. His eyes then went to the girl. Izuku could see her eyes closed, and a blush began to appear on her pale yet cute face. That's when Izuku noticed his left hand began to raise. It didn't take him long to know what he was going to do as he placed her hand on her head. He felt her flinch a bit as she paused in drinking. Feeling a bit guilty, Izuku began patting her head in a soft and calming way. Himiko blinked at this action, but continued drinking Izuku's blood, unconsciously purring dot much to her embarrassment and Izuku's amusement. They continued that way until the blonde girl licked the last of the blood on the now healed wound. T thank you for the blood. 
She yawned as she leaned over Izuku's shoulder, while the boy's hand never left the girl's head as it patted her blonde strands, causing the girl to feel a lot more exhausted. Izuku could only nod as his cheeks began to redden as he now realized that their position is dot somewhat awkward. He was sitting on a hospital bed with a girl sitting on his lap and they were basically hugging each other. He was wishing every deity in the heavens that recovery girl doesn't come here to save him from the embarrassment. He was about to say a word when the girl let out a soft snore. Indicating that she was asleep. Izuku could only sigh as he unconsciously used Pop Off to stick her body on him as he slowly stood up from the bed. He carried her to her own hospital bed before deactivating Pop Off. Slowly, he lowered her to the bed and tucked her in. The observed her sleeping four men had to admit that she looked cute. Judging by her face, she was at his age, if not a year older than him. Unconsciously, his hand went to her head, more specifically on her blonde locks as he stared at her intently. Her reactions earlier kept creeping their way in his mind and he couldn't help but be curious about her past. He had so many questions in his head. What had caused her to become a villain? Why did she save Viri? Does she really have a blood-related quirk? If so, then why was she so deprived of blood? And most importantly, who is Sato? Curiosity and genuine worry getting the best of him, Izuku slowly plucked a strand of hair and consumed it by letting blacklight absorb it. What? You think he was going to eat it? Who in their right mind would eat hair? In the multiverse, every Izuku sneezed. It took a few minutes before a wave of memories entered his mind. Flashback ends. Izuku could only sigh as he remembered seeing how Toga's parents treated her like a monster after she sucked blood from a bird. He saw how some of her peers would bully and avoid her after knowing about her quirk. Only Sato, a schoolmate of hers, was the only one to defend her from her bullies and even fight another student for bad-mouthing Toga. It was saddening for Izuku to remember the memory of Toga unable to control herself from stabbing said schoolmate when he was wounded after a fight and drinking his blood. But what made him sympathize more for the girl is that all the killings and crimes she had committed were all acts of self-defense from thugs, muggers, and even molesters. His fist clenched at the last one. After seeing her memories, Izuku informed Nezu about this and promised to make a proper and fair judgment for Toga. Izuku could only nod at the Chimera's words. Laughter echoed in the classroom of Class 1A, making Izuku snap out of his thoughts. Izuku looked up and was met with a view of Katsuki's hair being combed down. Izuku could only blink as Katsuki yelled at Kirishima and Siro, who was laughing their asses off. Katsuki's hair popped back to its old style. Izuku was confused why Katsuki's was like that until he remembered that the blonde boy had interned for best genist, so it made sense. Katsuki glanced at Izuku's direction. Izuku met the blonde boy's gaze. There was this awkward tension between them, Izuku could feel a sense that his former friend had changed a bit. The same sense of pride and confidence was still there, but what caught Izuku's attention was the feeling of respect coming from the blonde boy. Their stare down took seconds and the class were holding their breaths. Before they could prevent a fight from occurring, Kitsuki nodded at Izuku. Congratulations. He said as he looked away. They all blinked at the blonde's words. No insults, no yelling, no cursing. Just words of congratulations to a fellow student. Izuku was the most shocked at this. He had expected anything but this. Looks like the change in the blonde is a lot more than what he expected. Izuku could only scratch the back of his head. Thanks, I guess. Kitsuki only huffed and took a seat. Yup, this is interesting. He thought as he stood up to do a bit of stretching. That's when he noticed the intense aura surrounding Achako as she did some stances. The girls had been talking to themselves about going through their respective internships and were talking about how they all earned so much, well the five of them as Achako kept on doing the stances causing most of the class to sweat drop. But you know, the one who's improved the most. Is Midoriya. Kaminari spoke up, causing Izuku to look over at the electrification user who was talking to Shinso. I mean, duh. He's officially a hero now. Shinso said in a deadpan voice. Not to mention he saved so many civilians in Hosu and even captured Stain. Ajiro and Shoji nodded at Shinso's words. The mention of Stain's name caused Iida to flinch a bit as he clutched his bandaged arm. Siro, who had stopped laughing, looked over at Izuku with a smile. Dude, yeah, the hero killer. So happy that you are alive, no jokes, that's the important thing Kirishima interjected. It was so manly how you single handedly captured Stain and even retrieved him after that flying Nomu got him. We were so worried. Momo said, making the rest of the girls nod at her claim. Izuku chuckled at his classmates as he walked towards the front. I'm happy that you guys were worried about me. And I'm thankful for that. His face then looked at his class with a smile. I know that me being inducted early in the hero ranks seems to be a bit unfair for all of you. Trust me, I'm also still in shock. Don't let my early induction be something to be a cause of envy and insecurity. Instead, let this be a stepping stone for all of you. Let this be a sign that all of you are going down the same road as me. Izuku clenched his fist and raised it in front of him. 
Because I know that all of you will also be heroes, and I will be waiting for you all. Give it your all, I believe in you. Izuku gave his class a smile of assurance, making the tense atmosphere from the talk about Stain immediately dispersed. His words pierced the hearts of his classmates, even Katsuki. Those words caused a flame to be ignited within his classmates as their faces morphed determined smiles. That. Was. So manly Kirishima cried manly tears, clearly moved by the words of encouragement of their class representative. Iida, Todoroki, Ajiro, Tokoyami and Shinso were clapping their hands. The girls could only blush at the confidence and trust their crush classmate had for them. That made my heart skip a beat. Kiro Tsayu said bluntly as the other girls nodded at her statement. How can Midori be both cool and cute at the same time? That's illegal. Mina whispered, making the girls chuckle. That's Izuku for you Toru and Achako said simultaneously. Momo and Kaioka could only nod, as the latter was trying to hide her blush by looking away from Izuku, failing miserably. After a few minutes of the class conversing, Izuku had told them to go to their respective seats. As soon as Izuku sat down, he tried to use an ability that he had awakened and practiced after rescuing Eri. An upgraded version of thermal vision, but appears in a wider area of effect. Sonar senses, an ability first used by James Heller, also known as hunting. But instead of finding infected people, Izuku can find and differentiate a person with a quirk and a person without one. Basically the same as Heller's, but different. As he activated it, Izuku could see all of his classmates, even with his eyes closed. Ignoring the fact that all of his female classmates were somehow looking in his direction, Izuku could see Azawa walking towards the classroom with two, no three people behind him. Izuku could only smile as he recognized two of the three people his homeroom teacher is. Looks like Yuri and Toga somehow got permission to visit him in class. But his smile turned to confusion as he noticed something about the third person. They are quirkless, well kinda as the person silhouette is a bit lighter than the other three, but not light enough to be quirkless. His confusion turned to realization. Could this be? Izuku's thought process didn't finish when the door opened, and in came Izawa. Good morning, class. Before we begin, I'm pretty sure you all have noticed the addition of two desks here. Izawa said in his usual tired tone. Most of the class looked at the empty seats at the back of the classroom. Well, there is a reason for that. He paused to get the students' attention. Due to Midoriya being inducted as an official hero, it technically means that there is an empty slot in Class 1A however, Nezu didn't want to immediately graduate Midoriya because he is still too young to be sent on patrols as a sidekick. Well, not until two years later. That caused the class to be shocked and confused by that fact, but didn't say a word. That's why the staff had agreed to take in a transfer student to fill in the class's empty slot. Making this class have 21 students. They just kept quiet as Azawa sighed in exasperation. But due to unforeseen circumstances. Class 1A will be taking in a villain rehab student. But that then entered Yuri, Himiko, and a girl with pale skin, long blonde hair and aqua blue eyes. Judging by her appearance Izuku and her above average height, Izuku could tell that she is foreign. The girls, besides Yuri, wore the standard UA uniform, and Izuku had to admit, they both look good in it. Especially Himiko. Both Yuri and Himiko sported shy and cautious looks to the class. Before Shota Azawa could start introducing the new arrivals, Iri spotted Izuku and immediately turned a complete 180, as her shy face morphed into a happy smile. Papa she yelled as she ran towards Izuku, who had to keep himself from dying on the spot due to both her cuteness and the name she just called her, and gave the young hero a hug. Hey, Snowflake, how was your nap? Izuku said, hugging the little girl, who giggled at the embrace. The class watched in interest as Izuku embraced the little girl. It took them a few seconds to process what Iri had just called Izuku. Wait papa. They yelled in shock, causing both Izuku and Iri to look at them. However, Iri froze when her eyes landed on Tokoyami. She began shivering in fear as her past tormentor's face appeared behind the avian boy. Izuku noticed this and hugged her closer. It's okay, Iri. He's not overhaul. He's a friend. He won't hurt you. He whispered at the girl, making her stop shivering, but kept a tight grip on Izuku's uniform. He placed his left hand on her hair and patted her head. He then looked over at the class with a sheepish smile. Long story. Izuku said, earning him raised eyebrows from his classmates. Before the class could ask for Izuku to elaborate, Azawa cleared his throat to get the class's attention. Putting problem child's fathership aside. Said Azawa with a smirk, making Izuku blush in embarrassment. These are your new classmates. Introduce yourselves. He said to the two girls in front of the class. Both girls looked at each other. With a shrug, the taller girl took a step forward and smiled at the class. Hi my name is Melissa Shield, 17 years old. I hope we all get along with each other. She said with a smile as she bowed to the class. Most of the boys were blushing on how beautiful Melissa is, while the girls were looking over at Izuku's direction, wanting to see the boy's direction. 
Said boy, wore a poker face, but deep inside he was shivering at the sudden pressure that he felt directed towards him. He blinked when the girl in front suddenly looked over at his direction, as she gave him a scrutinizing look. It was exactly five seconds until her face lit up with recognition. You're Izuku Midoriya, right? She asked him. Izuku blinked at her before nodding in affirmation. Her face brightened up as she smiled widely at him. Uncle Might told me so much about you. Izuku's face morphed into confusion. Uncle Might. He pauses to think first. You mean All Might? Melissa nodded. Yes All Might. He talked so many good things about this class, especially you Izuku Midoriya. She said while pointing at Izuku. I also saw your early induction to the hero ranking in the news. Congratulations. The blush spread across Izuku's face as he scratched his cheek. Thanks. I guess. The class watched the interaction with knowing looks. The girls including Himiko pouted in jealousy. Himiko then cleared her throat to start talking, nervousness and anxiety still showing on her face. I am H. Himiko Toga, 16 years old. She said before looking away from the class. I am the re-rehab student. She whispered. It was said in a low volume, but the class still heard it. There was a tense silence in the classroom as soon as Himiko said that. Izuku looked around to see his classmates having wide eyes, some were even looking at her with disbelief. Looking back at Himiko, he saw that she also noticed the looks coming from his classmates. He could see the same pained and sad expression in her eyes that are now starting to tear up. Seeing this, Izuku clenched his fist. He couldn't take seeing someone who experienced negligence and discrimination be judged due to her status as a villain rehab student. As he was about to defend her from the looks his classmates were giving her, some spoke up before him. H. Himi? Is that really you? Everyone turned to the owner of the voice and saw Chako standing up from her seat. A look of disbelief and shock etched in her face. Izuku blinked and looked over at Himiko, who had her attention towards Chako. Her eyes held a look of shock, confusion, and recognition. Oh Acha. I is that you? She asked in a shaky voice. She said as she took a shaky step forward. Achako mimicked her action, taking a step forward. Her steps turned heavy until it became a sprint as she tackled Himiko with a hug. Himi it is you I have been looking everywhere for you, Achako cried as she tightly hugged the pale ash blonde girl. Himiko hugged the brown haired girl. They embraced themselves as they cried their hearts out. The class looked at the scene before them with mixed emotions. Izuku was a bit confused about how they knew each other. That's when a memory suddenly played in Izuku's mind. It was a bit blurry, but he could see images of two girls resembling a younger version of both Achako and Himiko standing in front of each other, with the young Achako had her hand outstretched to a crying young Himiko, looking like she was offering it to her. That's when Izuku realized it. Their childhood friends. Izuku replayed the memory that he saw earlier and couldn't help but smile at Himiko, a girl that had no one to support and call family found someone who genuinely cared for her. After the two stood up from the floor and apologized to Mr. Izawa. The man just waved them off and told the class to treat the two girls well. He then took Yuri to the playground that Nezu built in the campus due to Izuku's request. The little girl followed the tired man, not without Izuku kissing her on her horn, causing her to giggle, while the girls in the class had experienced a small heart attack at the cuteness the two cinnamon rolls are presenting. The class continued relatively quickly until it was lunchtime. Melissa and Himiko sat with Izuku, the rest of the girls, Iida, Shodo, and Shinso. They conversed with each other. Achako can be seen clinging on Himiko like a cola on a tree, when asked why she did this, it's because she doesn't want to lose her friend again. A fair point but quite funny when you look at it. Some of the class were still skeptical with Himiko being in the class, but was beginning to warm up with her childish cheerful nature, making her easily become friends with all the girls, especially Mina and Toru. Though, Izuku had a bad feeling when they started whispering to each other before looking at him and giggling like crazy. He felt an urge to increase his speed training for some reason. Amiko found another friend in Shinso, who also experienced quirk discrimination due to his brainwashing quirk being called villainous. Melissa had found a friend in Momo. Both have genius-level intellect and are born in a rich family, making it easy for them to converse. Though, when they started talking about their expensive gadgets and how big their rooms are, Achako and Himiko almost passed out reason, being broke. They were on their way back to their classroom for their heroics class when Izuku found himself thinking to himself as he looked over at Melissa's direction. Something about her silhouette being lighter than an average quirk user, but too dark to be a quirkless person. He knew the answer to this, but he just couldn't find the right time to confirm it to the blonde girl. He was snapped out of his thoughts when he felt his phone vibrate. Taking it he saw that it was a message from Nezu, immediately causing him to be alert. Whenever the chimera messages him it is about hero works or some heroes needing backup. Opening the message and reading its contents, his eyes widened before it turned into seriousness. He told his classmates that he will need to go do some hero stuff. He left them, not without ruffling Himiko's hair and running to the exit of the school. 
As he exited the building he activated black light and used disguise to change his uniform into his hero costume. Passing through the gate, he made a turn as biomass began swirling around his back. With a strong jump, Izuku flew through the air as black and crimson dragon wings appeared on his back. With a serious look and great speed, he flew towards the direction of the Fujiya hospital, where a group of villains are wreaking havoc. The same hospital where his mom is working as a part-time nurse. He wouldn't let any villain hurt his mom. Unbeknownst to our protagonists, it's not only his mom who he will be saving. Chapter 27. Saving the Ice Queen and Princess. Muffled sounds of explosions, crashes and screams of panic and pain can be heard from the inside of Fujitani Hospital, as two figures can be seen making their way through the hallways of the hospital. One of them was a young woman with long flaming yellowish-green hair, two bangs on each side. She is clad in a light gray double-breasted mini-dress with orange and black lining and slits on both sides of the skirt. Her collar, belt, and wrist guards are black with a smaller orange line, and the silver buttons resemble flat-headed screws. She also wears a belt with a temperature gauge on the front and a fire extinguisher on the back, black knee-high socks, and short black boots and a black mask connected to a red headband. The other one is a young woman with long periwinkle hair wearing a royal blue skin-tight bodysuit with a high black collar, pale mint green markings covering her torso from over her shoulders to between her legs, framed with turquoise, a matching stripe of the same two colors around both of her upper arms. On her feet, she wears a pair of knee-high boots, a thinning flap buttoned on each thigh, with turquoise swirls around her ankles, matching the thicker ones above her yellow gauntlets and wrist guards. She has a black strap around the top of each thigh, two small satchels attached, and two spiraling horns of hair protruding from behind her ears. These two are Mo Kamiji or Burnin and Najire Hado or Najire Chan. Sidekick and intern of Endeavor and Ryukyu, respectively. They were tasked with evacuating the hospital staff and their patients. As to why they were being evacuated, it's because of the ongoing villain attack today. So far, they have evacuated 90% of the hospital occupants and are now headed to the top floors, where the psych ward of the hospital is located. As to why the psych ward is located on the top floors and not in a different healing facility is unknown to the duo, they just continued their way to the location, occasionally blasting away villains that had somehow got past the heroes in the entrance. They had reached the final door of the long hallway, after checking for other patients in the other doors and having some of their boss's other sidekicks do the evacuation. As Burnin opened the door, they saw three people huddled together. One was a nurse with dark green hair tied up in a ponytail, the other was a middle-aged woman with straight shoulder-length white hair, and the last one was a young woman wearing red-framed rectangular glasses, with white hair with noticeable traces of red mixed in. The latter two of the trio appeared familiar to the heroine. Shit it's the boss wife and daughter. The fiery young woman said to herself as she and Najire approached the trio. Don't panic, ma'ams. Everything will be alright. She said as she helped the nurse, which is Inko, up to her feet, ignoring the look of recognition from the third woman. We'll take you to the evacuation site. Najire helped the other two up as they began to exit the building, flinching, as explosions echoed from the outside battles. Occasionally comforting the panicking Inko and the third woman, who is known to be Fayumi Todoroki, while the second woman, Rei Todoroki, was calm as if she was used to these events. They were on their way to the emergency exit, the walls of the hallway exploded from each side as a large figure with a very muscular build emerged from the hole. Boss Kai. Eerie. Are you two there? A bellowing voice said, making the rest of the group flinch. The man was wearing a black tank top with a standby symbol, olive drab pants with an armor-looking belt, blue socks, and a pair of orange sneakers. On his hands are a pair of massive gauntlets and knuckledisters on his fists. But the most noticeable feature was the black plague mask covering his face. Said mask has red lines, wide eyes and gold detail around the neck. The man looked over at the group for a few seconds before tilting his head. The heroine stepped in front of the other three as they readied themselves for an inevitable fight. Hmm. You guys aren't eerie. The man said as he stared at the people in front of him, but noticed the flinch that came from Inko, as she recognized the name that Izuku had saved a few weeks ago. But it appeared that one of you knows where she is. The man narrowed his eyes behind his mask. The man began cracking his knuckles as he started stomping his way to the group, who took steps backward. Burnin and Najira began sweating bullets as they stepped closer to the other three. The villain was a few meters away from the group when a blur of black, green and red suddenly hit the villain on the back and out of the wall. That suddenness shocked everyone in the room as their gaze went to the person who effortlessly sent the villain flying. Inko's expression brightened up as she recognized the person standing in front of them. Izuku she called out, making said boy look at her direction and smiled. Hey, mom are you guys okay? Are any of you hurt? He asked, looking over at his mom and her companion. Inko nodded then shrugged no, making Izuku sigh in relief. That's good. He said before looking over at the other women in the hallway, mainly at the two heroines. 
Izuku ignored the smirk and curious look coming from Burnin and Najaya respectively, and adopted a serious expression. You two escort them out of here, while I handle him. He gestured at the villain, who was beginning to stand up. Najaya Chan was about to protest when Burnin nodded before looking over at the rest of the evacuees. Burnin was about to take the civilians out of the building when Izuku raised his arms. Izuku then summoned a hunter, which caused the white-haired women to flinch a bit, but Izuku assured them that the creature was harmless well at least to civilians, the same can't be said with villains. And perverts. Looking over at the hunter, Izuku gave it orders. Keep them safe, okay. Don't let any villain get close to them and no killing. He as the creature growled in agreement. The creature led the way, with Burnin and the civilians following close by. Izuku was about to turn to face the villain, when he noticed Najair Chan still looking at him with curiosity and wonder. This caused Izuku to raise an eyebrow at the girl. Is there anything else you need? Izuku asked her. Said girl only floated towards him and met him face to face, as in face to face. The girl looked over at his face with curiosity sparkling in her eyes. The closeness caused a blush to slowly appear on Izuku's face, as he tried to look away at the girl's periwinkle eyes. You're Izuku Midoriya, right? She asked him, making Izuku blink in confusion, but nodded nonetheless. This caused the girl to tilt her head a bit, before smiling widely. You're really strong. I like you. She said before floating away to follow the group. Izuku was left wide-eyed at the girl's straightforward words. That was. Interesting. He whispered as he forced the blush away as he looked over at the girl's direction. Looking at her face and body, which he definitely didn't stare at for too long, he could tell that she was a few years older than him. Seeing that the rest had left, Izuku raised his hand and summoned a flyer, a vulture-sized bird that Alex used during his villain stage. Looking at it perched on his arm, Izuku looked at it with a serious look. Knock out any villains with plague masks and send them to any nearby heroes. He said to the creature. The flyer caught before flying away to do its given task. Izuku then turned to the direction of the villain, who was slowly standing up, and narrowed his eyes. Raising his hand, he took his hoodie and placed it over his head, as his eyes glowed red. The villain wearing a plague mask is looking for Eerie. Looks like Overhaul's group is searching for them. He whispered as he summoned his musclemus and charged the man, who mirrored his move with a growl. This was going to be a beatdown that Izuku would really enjoy. Explosions and panicked screams can be heard echoing the busy streets near Fujitani Hospital. What was supposed to be a peaceful day is now turned to chaos, as a group of villains start wreaking havoc in the area. All while the heroes in the area tried to apprehend them and keep any civilians from getting caught in the crossfires. Said hospital was now turned into a war zone as quirks and debris flew around like dodgeballs. Sticking out in the crowd was Ryukyu in her dragon form, sweating villains with her claws and tail. This is getting out of hand. Why are there villains invading the hospitals? This is the second one this week. She said as she slammed her tail towards a villain with a brown plague mask. The tail was blocked by a yellow force field that the villain had created. Said villain was a man wearing a traditional yukata and with a pair of jetta on his feet. Clicking her tongue in annoyance, she was about to continue attacking the villain, when a large fireball suddenly impacted the force field, engulfing it in flames. She looked over at the person responsible for the attack, and had to stop herself from sighing. Near her was the walking matchstick that is Endeavor, in his usual scowling face. Said hero sent waves of fire to the villain's direction, hitting mostly nothing as the flames were dodged by most of the villains. It doesn't matter what their reasons are, they will be in bars after this day. He said as he performed a flaming punch to an escaping villain, who cried in pain and was then knocked out due to the attack. Ryukyu saw this and frowned. Endeavor. Tone down your fire a bit. We need these villains alive for interrogation. She said, unaffected by the glare the number two hero is sending her. In her mind, she was disgusted at how ruthless Endeavor had been ever since the sports festival, as if something or someone had pissed him off. Judging by the scorch marks and fallen debris on the ground and streets, you can clearly tell that the flame hero wasn't pulling any of his punches. Well, in his case, his flames. Something that can be called reckless fighting in a place where patients are being held and treated. Don't tell me what to do, number 9. He snapped at her before looking away and sent another wave of fire to the villains. The emphasis on the number 9 as an insult to her hero rank. If you know what's good for you, then don't get in my way. The words in his mouth were interrupted by a punch that hit him square in the face. The punch sent him flying towards the hospital's wall. Ryukyu saw this and looked over at the culprit, barely blocking a punch sent to her direction. Gritting her teeth as the punch somehow caused a crack to be heard from one of her wings. That moment of pain was used in the villain's advantage, as he sent another punch towards the dragon woman's face. The man sent the heroine backwards, hitting the walls of the hospital and cars parked in the parking lot. Ryukyu groaned in pain as she looked over at the villain. Their man with a muscular build and light brown hair wearing a plague mask can be seen cracking his knuckles as a dark chuckle echoed in his mask. 
The villain stomped forward cracking his knuckles as a dark chuckle escaped his lips. Stand up, heroes and fight me give me a fight to the death he said as he stomped forward towards the group. Each stomp made the dragoon hero's heart pound stronger as the intimidating figure grew closer and closer. He was about to charge the heroine when Endeavor suddenly shot a stream of flames on the villain. The villain jumped to the side to dodge the flames coming from the charging hero. Charging forward, he did a boxing stance before sending a barrage of punches to the hero, who began blocking dodging the blows, failing miserably. The punches hit Endeavor all over the body, sending him flying once again. He landed on the wall, hard, as a groan of pain escaped his bleeding mouth. Shakily raising his eyes, he saw the villain charged at him with fists ready for a punch. The villain was a few meters from him when Ryukyu slammed her tail on the villain, who was sent flying to the other villain, who summoned a force field to prevent him from colliding with him. Bendo Rappa, one of our subordinates just called and confirmed that Boss Kai and Eri aren't here. Let's not waste any more time and leave this place. The man said, still keeping the force field active. The larger villain, now known as Rappa, just looked at him for a second before looking back at the heroes. He was about to talk when Endeavor, who just stood up, propelled himself to the villains as fire swirled around him. Don't turn your back on me prominence burn he yelled out as he sent a concentrated beam of fire straight to the villain's directions. If it weren't for the force field that the other villain created in time, the duo would have been toasted. As the fire began to dissipate, the force field slowly crumbled as the villain with a force field quirk dropped on one knee, panting and sweating. Clearly appearing to be a sign of quirk overuse. The number two hero didn't stop there as his fists and back were suddenly engulfed with flames. Flash fire fist propelling towards the villains, he sent a flaming punch to Rappa's head. Expecting the flaming fist to hit the villain, he was shocked when Rappa caught his hand and sent a punch on the hero's face, breaking his nose. Grabbing the hero from the hair and letting the man stand up before Spartan kicking the man to the nearby wall, creating a hole as feminine screams coming from the other side of the hole. Rappa ignored the screams as he blocked a claw slash from Ryukyu and used his quirk, rotating his shoulders with extreme speed. He hit the dragon woman on the face, making her stagger a bit. He then used his knee to hit her in the side. The draconic heroine was sent backward, making her go back to her human form, clutching her sides as blood escaped her lips. Looking down at the heroine, he turned around to face Endeavor. Said hero was slowly standing up, still glaring at his direction. This made Rappa snort in amusement. Number 2. Stand up and fight me he said as he began to stomp his way towards the hero. Ignoring the calls from his partner, he began to quicken his pace. As he sent a barrage of punches on the hero, a black and green blur fell in front of him. As his first punch impacted on a wall that suddenly appeared because of the blur, he was surprised to feel his momentum recoiling back to his arm as spikes protruded on the surface of the black wall that he hit, which sent him flying back. Still shocked by the momentum, he barely dodged a large, spiked fist headed towards his head. Fixing his balance, he looked over at the person who had stopped him and was surprised to see Izuku in front of him. Well, well well. If it isn't the youngest hero, Blackwatch. He said as he cracked his knuckles. Looks like this day just keeps getting better and better, said boy just looked at him with a serious expression. He just finished off the other plague mask villain, not consuming him unfortunately, before coming here as soon as he heard a loud explosion and the cries of his mom. It was surprisingly easy to beat that guy, then again the man used his mouth to fight. Talking smack and was constantly trying to touch him, easily giving out the nature of his quirk. For the man to realize that he can't use his quirk against Izuku's erasure after five minutes of trying to get close to him was amusing. After knocking the man down, Izuku checked the man's person and found five syringes of trigger, a type of quirk-enhancing drug that drastically makes the quirk of the person who uses it a lot more stronger. Though it may be due to the enhancing properties of the drug is what caused it to be harmful as the user's senses will be deeply affected by it. He took the drugs as evidence to give to the police later. I'm Kendo Rappa let's have a fight to the death the man in front of him said, causing him to blink. Izuku watched the man crack his knuckles as he looked at the young hero with amusement. Not much of a talker are we. It doesn't matter. Now give me a fight to the death, Hero the man said, readying his quirk as he charged at Izuku, as the boy glared at him with red eyes staring at his soul. He was in front of Izuku when he sent a punch to the boy's face, only to notice something odd. His shoulders feel stiffer than usual. As it was, he couldn't feel his quirk. Izuku just lifted his hand and caught the fist before headbutting the man. The force of the headbutt was strong enough to cut the mask covering the man's head, as the man's light brown hair can be seen from the cut, and sent him flying backwards. Rappa landed on his feet and was about to charge again when his vision suddenly swirled. He staggered on his feet, forcing himself to stay standing. Such power. He almost gave me a concussion, maybe he already did. And he hasn't used his quirk yet. He thought as he tried to look in Izuku's direction. In just one move. I was. Completely outmatched. 
Black Watch then sprinted towards his direction, black light swirling in his arms as Whipfist was summoned. Reeling his bladed arm back, he sent the blade straight to the man's face. That is when a yellow barrier covered Rappa, deflecting the blade. Izuku stared at the barrier with interest as he retracted his blade. Looks like you liked my barrier. Izuku looked over at the villain wearing a yukata, with a similar yellow barrier around him. No point in destroying it, it's as hard as steel. Only people with strength that rival All Might will be able to destroy it. The green-haired boy hummed at that and smirked. Strength that rivals All Might, eh? He thought as he charged a barrier user, who didn't even make a move. How about someone stronger? He yelled in his mind as he summoned his hammer fist and drove his fist towards the barrier. As the massive fist impacted the barrier, it instantly cracked, causing both villains and heroes to look at him in shock. The barrier villain was about to make another barrier when he could feel his quirk. His confusion turned into panic as Izuku was suddenly in front of him. The last thing that the villain saw was red eyes staring at him with indifference as the large fist landed on his jaw, breaking it and knocking him out in the process. In a moment of shock and surprise, Endeavor used this moment to blindside the still stunned Rappa. Propelling himself to the villain, he sent a devastating and flaming punch on the villain's head, causing him to fly towards the direction of the escaping civilians and sidekicks. Not noticing the group, Endeavor gathered a large amount of fire in his palms before pointing it towards the villain. Take this villain jet burn. The group saw this and was shocked to see a stream of fire heading their direction. Boss, wait dad, no burn and Fayumi cried out, to no avail as the fire was quickly sailing to their direction. Rappa saw this and without hesitation, stood up and jumped in front of the group while raising his arms to block out the attack. He closed his eyes as he waited for the fire to engulf him. He waited and waited, but nothing seemed to come near him. Slowly, he opened his eyes and blinked in confusion to see Endeavor on the ground, unconscious. Standing next to the hero was Izuku glaring daggers at the downed hero. He noticed that the boy's eyes were red. As he questioned the turn of events, he felt his consciousness slowly fade as he collapsed on his knee. Rappa could hear footsteps going near him, but he had no strength to even look up. To be able to sacrifice your own well-being for the sake of others, despite being a villain, is a great feat to hold. I am grateful, Kendo Rappa. Izuku said, stopping in front of him. However, I still need to arrest you. So, I'm sorry for this. That's the only thing he heard as the boy chopped his neck, sending him to his unconsciousness. Izuku continued to look over at the man with a sad expression. It's a shame, you would have been a great hero, Rappa. He thought as he looked back at Endeavor, still knocked out, and narrowed his eyes. Nezu will hear about this. He whispered before sighing as he faced the group. The sight of his mom and Todoroki's sister and mom looking traumatized by the last attack sent a pain in his chest. They didn't deserve to experience that. He then looked at Burnin, who had a betrayed expression on her face, and quite frankly, Izuku couldn't blame her for it. To have her boss recklessly attack a villain when there are civilians and sidekicks nearby is outright stupid. Wanting to make the atmosphere less tense, Izuku walked towards them and smiled. Let's get you all out of here. He said, making the rest look at him. Inko immediately approached him with a hug as she cried in her son's arms. Izuku, returning the hug, could only stroke his mom's hair as whispered words of comfort to her, in order to calm her down. Thank you. Izuku turned to the owner of the voice, seeing Rei looking at him with gratitude in her eyes. Thank you for saving us, Black Watch. She said as she bowed slightly to the green-haired boy, Fayumi following her example. A young hero could only smile at them and nodded. It's nothing ma'am. It is a hero's role to ensure the safety of the people around them. Though, not everyone thinks like that. Whispering the last line, as he sent a side glance at the number two hero on the floor. But I'm not the only one you should thank. Thank him, for he was the one who stepped in when the fire was approaching all of you. He said as he pointed to the unconscious Rappa. Ray nodded as Fayumi spoke up. We know, but still thank you. Not only for saving us, but also saving Shoto. That caused Izuku to blink dumbly. Why Shoto? Now that I think about it, they do look like Todoroki. Are they perhaps his thoughts were cut off when Ray spoke up again? Ah yes, Shoto told me that you were the reason why he began using his fire again. Because of you, my son is now becoming the best version of himself. And I am very thankful for that. They again, bowed in show of gratitude for the young boy, who could only blush at their sincerity. He could only wave off their words as he told them that he was only doing what he thought was the right thing to do. He was too focused on brushing off the thank yous that he failed to see the blush in Fayumi's face. Something that Rain noticed and chuckled inwardly. Looks like her daughter has a crush. Looking over at the boy, Rei couldn't blame Fayumi. The boy is quite attractive and is a genuinely good person, a literal opposite of his husband. If only you had been born a few years earlier. She sighed as he stopped a blush from spreading on her cheeks, but she was unable to stop her heart pounding loudly. In class 1A, Shoto Todoroki suddenly felt a sudden shift in the air as a smile slowly crept in his face. 
Why do I get the feeling that I will be calling Midoriya both brother and daddy in the future? As Izuku comforted and escorted the three civilians out of the place, Ryukyu, alongside Najire, stared at the boy in question. Ryukyu looked at him with gratitude and fondness. Strong, caring, and heroic. No wonder Rumi fell for you. The dragoon hero said as she was being helped to stand up by her intern. Hey Ryukyu. Najire called out, making the heroine snap out of her thoughts. Looking over at her intern, she saw her looking at Izuku with curiosity lingering in her eyes. What is it, Najire? She asked her intern. Do you think Midoriya would like it if I asked him out on a date? Najire asked, causing Ryukyu to trip over on her feet. Not you too, Najire. Back in UA, Izuku can be seen in front of Nezu's desk. He had just finished reporting to the Chimera about the mission, and to say that Nezu was terrifying when he is angry is a complete understatement. Izuku was sure he heard him saying something about chopping the man's body into small pieces and feeding it to a pet called Fluffy or something, but shrugged it off. Izuku was about to leave when Izawa entered the room as per Nezu's request. Nezu asked Izawa to gather up the rest of the UA staff regarding the coming exams. Izuku was about to leave when Nezu asked him to stay for the meeting, for he had something planned for the exams, and it required his presence. He was about to protest, but realized that it was important if Nezu requested it. So, he agreed to join the meeting. Izawa, however, immediately saw what Nezu was planning and could only grumble. I don't get paid enough for this. Izuku heard this and gave the man a deadpan look. I don't get paid at all. He said as he crossed his arms. That's until he clumsily caught an envelope that Nezu threw at him. Izuku looked at the envelope and looked at Nezu and back at the envelope. Seeing Nezu's nod, Izuku opened it and had stopped his eyes from popping out of its sockets. In the envelope was a stack of money, a large stack of money. That would be your first payment for a job well done, Blackwatch. Nezu said, chuckling in amusement at the boy's flabbergasted expression. Mentally slapping himself, Izuku hid it in his pocket and turned to Izawa's direction. Never mind. He said as Izawa rolled his eyes before exiting the room, grumbling about problem children getting paid higher than him. Passed forward to the day of the final exams. Outside the campus, Class 1A minus Izuku stood in front of the UA staff. They have just finished taking the written portion of their exams and are pumped up for their practical exams for two reasons. One, after this they will be able to attend the summer training camp for the heroics department. And two, according to Class 1B, the practical exams will only be fighting with robots, which made Kaminari and Mina happy. The written portion was a breeze for the majority of the class, due to the help of Momo, Melissa, and Izuku, when tutoring the class about subjects they don't know much about. But due to a sudden mission request for Izuku, he had been excused and had to leave early, before the start of the practical portion of the exams. Much to the disappointment of the girls in the class, even Melissa felt saddened that Izuku wasn't with them right now. In such a short amount of time, Melissa had learned so much about One for All, with the help of Izuku's hero journal. They had grown closer because of this, which Melissa will admit is closely becoming infatuation. And again, Izuku was a charming boy that can make anyone easily get closer to him, albeit unintentionally. The test exercise will begin shortly. As always started, as he informed them that if they fail, they won't be able to join the forest training camp trip. As Mina and Kaminari began cheering in excitement for the camp, Nezu chose this moment to enter the scene via Zawa's scarf. Sorry, I'm afraid not due to various reasons, we're changing the contents of the test, starting today the Chimera said, causing the class to become shocked and pause in their cheers. He then explained how with the increase of villain attacks, they will begin implementing person-to-person -person battle activities. We will have you form pairs to engage in combat with these educators. Nezu said as he pointed his finger toe to the rest of the UA staff, which caused a wave of shocked looks from the students. Well, at least that was the original plan. He said as he looked over at Shinso, Melissa, and Himiko's direction. Due to two of the three newer students lacking in experience in fighting, we've decided on a different approach. Nezu started as he looked over at the rest of the class, who were showing mixed emotions, mostly anticipation, curiosity, and dot fear. This caused a smirk to form on the teachers' faces. After discussing it in a meeting, it will be all of you against one person. Shock and disbelief can be seen in the class's faces. As always saw this and chose it as his cue. That being said, class 1A. He paused and looked at them with a look of seriousness. Dot your opponent will be. His words were cut off when a figure landed in between the class and the staff. The class were shocked to see the person in front of them and immediately grew anxious. The figure stood straight and gave the class a menacing smile. Me. Izuku said, finishing as always words. He looked at them with scleras pitched black, and her eyes as are crimson, as an intimidating aura leaked out of his body. Your opponent will be me, heroes. I hope you come at me with everything you've got. If not. He released a dark chuckle, which didn't sit well with the class, and the staff as Nezu just laughed at it. He stopped chuckling and looked at them with narrowed calculating eyes. 
and I, Mercer, will destroy you. Chapter 28.1 Class 1A vs Mercer A view of the familiar mock city greeted the students of Class 1A, as most of them had been in the place during the entrance exam. They couldn't believe that it had been so long since they've been in the place, it gives them a small tinge of nostalgia as they walk out of the bus. Though that nostalgia was immediately eliminated and was replaced by anxiety and nervousness when they remembered why they were there in the first place. Right, they were here for the test exercise. An exam where they have to face Izuku, one of their classmates in combat in order to pass, and for them to go to the camp like they wanted to. At first they were confident that Izuku would go easy on them, but remembering how he acted back in UA today made them doubt that possibility. Looking at their class rep, their anxiety grew as the green-haired boy had a blank expression on his face that looked really intimidating to them. Izuku Midoriya or Mercer as he would call himself, their opponent for the test exercise. They wouldn't really mind fighting him to pass, but the way Izuku showed himself to them is rather unsettling. His usual bright smiles and positive aura were gone as he now claimed an intimidating, villainous persona, which for some reason had terrifyingly suited him. The majority of them shivered as the memory of Izuku threatening them was etched in their mind. They would have forfeited the exam entirely if it weren't for Nezu speaking up before them. Alright listen up students the rules are simple. The chimera started as he stood on top of All Might's shoulder. The city is under attack and a hero is in need. You all have exactly 35 minutes to either escape through the opposite side of the mock city or capture the villain, which is Midoriya here, using these anti-quirk cuffs. He paused to take a sip of tea, signaling a cue for Izawa to continue. While the exam is taking place, Problem Child will be wearing quirk limiters so that he won't go out of control with his quirk or get too reckless in hitting all of you. We'll also be monitoring the fights for us to respond if things seem to get out of hand. He said, glancing at Izuku, who just stared at the building before him. We don't want to have 21 critically injured students in Recovery Girl's office anyway. He then looked at his class. Everything clear? He asked, earning a couple of yes sir and anxious nods from his students. Now that's settled. Nezu started as he looked over at Izuku. You have 20 minutes to prepare, Midoriya. Izuku looked at the chimera and back to the buildings and back to Nezu. Make it 15. He said as he bolted his way at the entrance of the mock city. The students were confused at this. Usually people would want a longer time to prepare for something, but for Izuku to ask for a shorter time is a bit confusing, if not concerning. It's like he's been like this before. Yuraka thought as she looked over at the retreating form of the hooded boy, who didn't even bat an eye in their direction. She was snapped out of her stupor as a hand landed on her shoulder, making her look over at her seatmate's direction. Amiko gave her a smile filled with determination. Let's pass this, Acha the pale blonde girl said to her childhood friend. Achako couldn't help but smile at Amiko's direction. She nodded as she touched the transform user's hand. Yes, let's do our best to pass this exam, Yuraka. Iida said, giving her a smile. The rest of the class nodded as well. She could see the fear and uncertainty in their eyes, but it was all washed away by the determination that is building up. Achako couldn't help but smile at this and nodded. Yeah she said, giving Himiko a determined look. Let's pass this. Nezu could only chuckle at the interaction as he took another sip of tea. Well, this'll be interesting. You all have 15 minutes to prepare. Good luck, students break a leg he said, as he leapt down All Might's shoulder and led them to the nearby monitoring area. He was then followed by the other UA staff who wished the students good luck. Azawa stayed back for a bit and looked over at his other students. Do your best, problem children. Plus ultra. He said tiredly, as he followed the rest to the monitoring area and silently wished that problem child would hold back for God's sake. This is an exam after all. The class watched as the teachers left the men stood there for a few seconds before Katsuki spoke up. So, what's the plan? They looked over at his direction and were shocked. Bakugo looked at their surprised looks and raised an eyebrow. What? The UA staff gathered in front of multiple screens, akin to those of the entrance exam. The screen showed the different parts of the mock city, which was partially clean from all the damages that had happened from the exam a few months back. They sat on their respective seats as they stared at the screen, waiting patiently for the 15-minute mark to end. For someone being outnumbered, Midoriya seems calm. Present Mick broke the silence as he stared at the green-haired boy running in the mock city. It's only logical. It is important for heroes to be calm even if the odds are stacked against them. As always said as he entered his sleeping bag and sat in the corner of the room. The racer's right, but is it a good idea for Midoriya to be the one to face his classmates? Ectoplasm asked, looking over at Nezu. My thoughts as well. I know that he's already a pro hero and has a strong quirk, but for it to be 21 against 1 is a bit of overkill, don't you think? Powerloader added. Nezu waved them off and smiled. I understand your worries, but it was Midoriya's idea that he must be the one to test his classmates. He said before sipping his tea. 
And besides, if we want class 1A to grow and mature, who else is the right person to help them but their class representative? It's quite unfortunate that your class already took their test exercise Kansas. Vlad King could only sigh. As much as I am down to the idea of Midoriya helping my class, I am not quite sure if Monoma's superiority complex and grudge against him would be helpful. He said. Remembering how his blonde student keeps saying nonsense about their class being superior against class 1A. It was really annoying on Vlad's part, good thing Kendo keeps him in check. And by that, he means Kendo knocks Monoma out to shut him up. Putting that aside, I am really excited to see how Midoriya would work them up. Midnight said, licking her lips as she looked over at the screen that showed Midoriya. Her comments caused a wave of groans, as most of the people in the room just pinched the bridge of their noses. Somehow, you saying that while licking your lips is quite inappropriate, Kayama. 13 said in a deadpan tone. He may be a pro, but he's still a kid. Oh, stop. Don't talk like you didn't stare at his body back in the sports festival. She said, smirking. Remembering 13 spacesuit somehow leaking blood on the helmet opening when Midoriya got shirtless after his fight against Todoroki. I, I don't can know what you're tea talking about. 13 stammered, looking away. She was glad that she is wearing her hero costume today, if not, her beet red face would have been exposed. The others in the room couldn't help but to groan and shake their heads at Midnight's flirty attitude. The logical woman. Azawa thought as he sighed and closed his eyes. There was still time for him to take a nap, so he'd take it before watching the problem child traumatize his classmates. All Might remained silent as he looked up at the screen, showing Izuku slowing his pace as he reached the center of the mock city. He couldn't help but smile at the boy. In just a quick time, you have grown to become a great hero, young Midoriya. You even helped Melissa learn to use one for all better than me. I am looking forward to you climbing the ranks and even surpassing me. He thought as they all watched Izuku, waiting for the prep time to end. In the center of the mock city, Izuku arrived in the very familiar street where he had destroyed the zero pointer back in the entrance exam. Passively looking over at the ruins that his encounter with the forsaken robot had caused and around the city. Without a word, Izuku raised his left arm as a tendril of biomass escaped the palm of his hand, twitching as it began to take shape. In just a few seconds, a flyer was formed on his hand as it shrieked. Izuku looked at it as it flapped its wings and turned in his direction. Izuku raised his other hand to pet as he whispered. You know what to do. The creature shrieked once more and flew away from his hand and to the direction of the entrance of the mock city. All while cawing like a crow. Seeing that the creature was far enough, he then looked up to a nearby building and used wall running to scale the building. In just seconds, he reached the edge of the building rooftop before flipping onto it. Landing in a crouching position, Izuku slowly stood up and turned to the edge of the building. He looked down in the streets below and marveled at the residual destruction from the past entrance exam. He looked down in the streets below and could see some of his hunters and brawlers tearing apart the other buildings and flyers circling around the mock city. Seeing that all of his pack are in position, he took a deep breath and sat down in a meditative position. Closing his eyes, Izuku focused as he did something that was new to him, and he had only used it once back in the Fujitani hospital mission. Concentrating, he felt a tug from his mind and opened his eyes. The view that met him was the flyer he summoned circling around the city. Looks like Hive Mind is successful. Hive Mind, an ability he had acquired after consuming the blood from a villain with a mind reader quirk during his first patrols as a hero. Blacklight had changed and evolved it into a mind-linking quirk that allowed him to send his consciousness into his pack and use it for reconnaissance purposes. That was the purpose of him summoning the flyer back in Fujitani Hospital to scout the area for any villains planning a sneak attack against the heroes fighting and civilians evacuating. Though, he hadn't mastered it yet, hence him only being able to use it on one of his pack. He mentally ordered the flyer to land on the top of a lamppost near the entrance of the mock city and waited for his classmates to enter the exam site. He could always use his sonar senses, but that only allowed him to see silhouettes. With Hive Mind, he would be able to link with the flyer to fly near them to spy on them and know what they are planning and location without getting closer being seen. The only downside to this new ability is that he can't control the movement of the creature he links with, that's why he can only command the flyer through his mind. Waiting patiently, he heard the horns blared, indicating that the exam had started. Looking down, the flyer's eyes and by extension, Izuku's eyes watched as his classmates ran into the entrance of the gates. He could see them talking to each other, which appeared to be them talking about something as they traveled through the streets. He looked at the running group and noted that they were headed towards his direction. Cutting off his link with the flyer, not before commanding it to follow the class from a safe distance, he opened his eyes and stood up. He could hear Katsuki's explosions echo through the city and noticed that the sound was getting closer. Using sonar senses, he saw that his classmates were now his location before deactivating it. The time for waiting is over. He said as he raised his arms and summoned blacklight. 
At the end of his palms, tendrils of biomass escaped his body as it formed into two brawler hunters and four normal hunters. Without a word all of them ran to the edge of the building and jumped away, with Izuku now in his Mercer persona, letting himself fall to the street below, whilst the pack went to scatter around the area, waiting for their orders. The direction where the escaping group went. Sounds of haste footsteps and explosions can be heard echoing in the streets of the test side, as Class 1A made their way towards the direction where they believed Izuku was located. Looks of nervousness and uncertainty can be seen on some of their faces. As the class made their way towards the direction where Izuku is located, Kitsuki, mid-explosion, looked back at Momo and Melissa's direction. Are you too sure that this plan is going to work? Momo nodded at him as she spoke up. I believe so. Despite Midoriya having a strong quirk, it is important to remember that he is wearing quirk limiters, which halves his overall strength and abilities. Adding with it being a 21 against 1 battle, it will be hard for him to take us all on at once. Melissa added. The other members of the class nodded at the two smartest girls' words, but not Katsuki. He may not say it, but he knows that Izuku is far more stronger than he is. Easily rivaling All Might in strength, if not surpassing already. Just because he has limiters, doesn't mean that it will make it easier for them to win this fight. He may be their age, but Izuku is still a pro hero. Making him more experienced in fighting multiple opponents and in fighting in general. His thoughts were interrupted when a voice called out to him. Lighten up, Bakubro. This is just an exam after all, and besides, it'll be unmanly if we back out now. Kirishima said as he smiled toothily at the spiky blonde boy, who just gave him a glance before looking back to the front. Yeah, it's not like Midori is going to go all out against us, right? Kaminari interjected, causing a long silence to suddenly occur in the group. The silence made the electrification user sweat bullets as he looked around his classmates. All right. He asked again, but received the same silence. If it was only that easy. Kitsuki thought, clearly doubting this plan. His thoughts were suddenly cut off when a loud sound of something large falling was heard a few meters outside the alley they were traveling across. Moving faster, they hurried themselves to the direction of the sound and exited the alley. Kitsuki was the first one to exit the alley and halted his movements as he stood across Izuku, hood up with his hands in his jacket pocket, and was exiting from the middle of a crater. An aura of seriousness can be sensed from the green-haired boy, something Kitsuki only felt back in their match in the sports festival. One by one, the whole class exited the alley and paused next to Kitsuki. They looked over at Izuku or should we say, Mercer, who remained silent as the class stared at him with nervousness rising. The staff observing the class watched in anticipation as the students faced their class representative. They silently wished the class good luck in overcoming this challenge ahead of them and for Izuku to not go overboard. Welcome heroes, to your demise Mercer said, as he stretched his arms to the side, smirking at their tensed expressions. They were about to speak up when Mercer suddenly charged at them, blacklight swirling around his arms. His eyes locked on the spiky blonde in the front, summoning Musclemus as he cocked his left arm in a punching pose. The class tensed as Kirishima jumped forward, intercepting the attack. Watch out, Bakubro Kirishima yelled, crossing his hardened arms as he went in front of Bakugo. Mercer's punch landed on Kirishima's hardened skin, causing the hardening user to grit his teeth in pain. The impact of the punch sent a shockwave in the area, causing the class to cover their eyes and take a step back. The mock villain for the exam narrowed his eyes at the red-haired boy's reaction. Seeing that Mercer was somehow distracted, Kirishima pushed him off of him as Rikido Sato and Mashirao Jiro charged at him. Fist and tail headed to the green-haired boy. Their attacks were blocked by a spiked shield summoned. Without a word, the villain of the match pushed their attacks with ease as he sent them flying. He lunged at Sato with his right arm forming into Musclemus, only for him to jump away as a wall of ice was sent towards him. Landing down a few meters away, he was again forced to leap away as Katsuki propelled towards his direction. The blonde sent an explosion towards his direction, which Mercer blocked with his shield. Now Izuku heard Katsuki yell. He then heard footsteps to his side. Looking up, he was met with Yuga Aoyama pointing in a random direction. That's when he noticed a pair of floating gloves and immediately realized what they were planning. Art of seduction Aoyama said as he shot a laser beam in the direction of the gloves. Sorry about this, Izuku light refraction the voice of Toru Hagakur, yelled as the beam of light hit her and bounced towards Mercer's direction. This forced Mercer to close his eyes and cross his arms as it landed. The hit caused Mercer to be launched and crashed towards a building, creating a large hole. Seeing this, Momo looked over at Kaminari and nodded. Kaminari, Bacha the boy said as he shot a metal disc over at the hole where Mercer is in as lightning surrounded his pointer finger. Target Electro as he said that the lightning on his finger was shot towards the disc in the hole. The attack caused a smoke cloud to occur in the area. Not wasting any more time, Hantasiro created hardened tape from his elbows and sent it towards Mercer's direction. Did you get him? Kaminari asked, panting slightly. He still wasn't used to using his quirk in just one part of his body. 
but after his performance in the sports festival, he had asked Izuku for some advice on making use of his quirk. Izuku told him to try using his quirk on one part of his body and lower the amount to stop his brain from frying. So far it was really helpful, Kaminari just needs more practice with it. Siro nodded as he tried to keep Izuku in place. However Katsuki knew better. Demitria won't be that easy to beat. He's way too smart to be captured that easily. He thought as he narrowed his eyes on the smoke cloud. Without saying anything, Katsuki charged at the hole. He was surprised to see Ido also charging at the wall, and a wave of ice headed to the hole in the wall. Looks like Four Eyes and Icy Hot have the same idea. Ignoring the call from their classmates, Katsuki sent an explosion to the hole as he eat a ready to kick. To his shock and surprise, his arm was grabbed and had slammed him in the rubble. He groaned at the impact as he slowly sat up and heard Eid yelping in pain as well. As the smoke cleared, the class were wide-eyed at the display that greeted them. It was Mercer sitting on top of Ida as he was holding Siro's tape. Eyes once green were glaring crimson towards Todoroki as the hood of his jacket fell when his hair began floating. The burn marks from the lightning can be visibly seen on his body are now healing. Nice try. The mock villain whispered, staring at the electrification user. But it didn't work. He finished as he smirked, making Kaminari shake in fear. Snapping out of his shock, Katsuki jumped towards Izuku and cocking an explosion on his palm, only for it to be dodged by Mercer as he leaned forward. Iida then used this chance to stand up and kick Midori away from him. Mercer flew backwards, forcing him to let go of Siro's tape, and was met with a concentrated explosion from above, courtesy of Katsuki, who had used the momentum from his jump to propel upward. The green-haired boy shakily stood up only for him to flip away from a wave of ice that would have encased him. Landing gracefully, Izuku looked up to see all of his melee classmates to surround and charge him simultaneously. Looks like he's about to be captured. Snipe said, earning nods from Powerloader and Present Mick. I don't think so. Nezu, Azawa, All Might and Midnight said simultaneously, making the others look at them with raised eyebrows before looking back to the screen. As the Katsuki and the others attack hit Izuku head on. But to their surprise, Izuku didn't budge. That's when he remembered his fight with Izuku in the sports festival and widened his eyes. Shit shock absorption. Fall back he yelled, propelling backward, seeing Izuku channeling blacklight on his arms. Block Hiroshima was cut off when Mercer summoned Musclemus and punched the hardening user on the stomach. The impact made the spiky-haired boy surprised but mostly in pain, as the punch had broken through his hardening. Kirishima fell on his knee and was kicked in the face, and was sent flying to a nearby car, crashing onto it. Kiri Kirishima Mina and the other girls cried out, running towards the downed boy. Without looking, Izuku kicked Sato to the side, sending him towards Aoyama and Toru, who yelped in surprise. Himiko lunged at him with daggers on her hand, swiping and slashing Mercer, as he tried his best to evade her pursuits, and pushed her away. Ajiro then swung his tail towards the blacklight user's head, only for Izuku to swat it away and grab him by the neck. Ajiro tried to release the green-haired boy's grip, only for Mercer's hand to grip tighter. The tail user was then lifted up from the ground, making Ajiro panic a bit. Tell me, Whiplash. Do you wish to fly? He heard Mercer whisper. Not letting him respond, the villain threw him in the air. The class watched as Ajiro flew away with speed, making them panic. That's until Tsayu Asui jumped on the buildings nearby and wrapped Ajiro with her tongue, successfully stopping the boy from harshly landing on a pile of rubble. Huffing, Mercer barely dodged a kick from Iida as he jumped on the walls of the building and began wall running as Dark Shadow began pursuing him. He dodged and blocked the swipes from the sentient quirk. He was then bombarded by a flock of pigeons, forcing him back to the ground where he rolled out to dodge a claw swipe from Dark Shadow. In between evasions, Mercer flipped over another kick from Iida as he activated sonar senses. He saw Koda and Tokwe Ami silhouette hiding behind a nearby building. Thinking he needs to do something about them, Mercer jumps over a roundhouse kick from Iida and a claw attack from Dark Shadow, and uses Glide to go towards the duo's direction. Using the momentum of the Glide to his advantage, he performed a cannonball with extreme speed as he launched himself towards the two, who barely dodged the attack due to Dark Shadow's warning. He was about to charge the duo when Dark Shadow swiped him on the cheek. Feeling his blood trickle down his cheek, Mercer slowly looked over at the shadow bird's direction. The red gleam in his eyes, becoming electric as he glared at Tokoyami's quirk. That's it. I'm pissed. After saying that, crimson fire erupted from his wound and spread in the room. But the Todoroki was cut off when Tokoyami and Koda were sent flying towards his direction. He ran towards his classmates to make sure they weren't too hurt. He was shocked at the amount of fire that had just exploded in the building and was about to question Tokoyami about this when he caught movement from the corner of his eye. Summoning an ice wall around them, he was shocked to see red ice impacting on his bluer ice wall. Wait, did he copy my quirk? He shook off that thought and made a mental reminder to ask Midoriya about it as he picked up Tokoyami and Koda and slowly carried them away. 
They didn't go far as Mercer launched himself towards the ice wall, the suddenness of the impact sent Todoroki and Ko to fly away. If it weren't for Todoroki using his ice to make an ice barrier to somehow soften their landing, the trio would have been badly hurt. Shakily raising his head, Todoroki saw Mercer emerge from the shattered ice wall. The Verdette began walking towards his direction, a loud thud heard as he took a step forward. Izuku's advances were stopped when he saw movement from the corner of his eye. Turning to the side, his eyes widened at the sight that met him. It was Momo, looking at him with determination while carrying what looks to be a... Wait, is that a grenade launcher? Present Mick asked, unintentionally activating his quirk as he spat the water that he was drinking over the now annoyed Azawa, who glared at him. He saw this and smiled sheepishly as he apologized. I'm sorry Izuku. Momo thought as she pulled the trigger of said grenade launcher. Mercer, however, didn't look phased as he lifted his hand, summoning his blade and blocked the attack. As the grenade impacted on the blade, Mercer charged through the smoke towards Momo. He was halfway close to the creation wielder when he heard Achako's voice in the area. Release. Out of instinct, he turned to the zero-gravity girl, only to meet a car that sent him crashing towards a nearby building. Falling to the ground, the blacklight user could feel his blood boil for some reasons unknown to him. Frustration built up in his mind as he shakily stood up in the narrow space between the car and the building. Unable to keep his cool, he growled as he gripped the bottom of the car and flung it away with only one hand. He turned to the direction where the car came from and saw Chaco panting slightly, next to her was Melissa. Judging by the strength and speed of the force given to that throw, only someone with a strength-enhancing quirk can do that type of throw. With Melissa being the only one with that type of quirk, he concluded that it was her who threw the car. Plus, she has pale yellow lightning surrounding her body. So this is one for all. Realizing that she was the biggest threat among the class, Mercer was about to charge at her when he suddenly collapsed on one knee. Damn it I used too much biomass, he could feel himself panicking as he watched as his classmates began gathering next to Ichako and Melissa. In the monitoring area, Nezu couldn't help but chuckle at Izuku's actions. Looks like things just got a lot more interesting. You never fail to amuse me, Midoriya. He thought as he sipped his tea. Uh, Nezu. I have a question, if you may. Ectoplasm spoke up. The chimera turned to the direction of the ghost-themed hero. What is it? He asked, tilting his head. How strong are Midoriya's quirk limiters? This question made Nezu think for a bit before looking back at the hero with a smile on his face. His limiters halves the power of his quirk. He said. This information caused the rest of the people in the room to quiet down, before an inevitable would escape their lips, which caused Nezu to laugh maniacally. I, I can't believe it. Power Loader said, clearly shaken at the information given to him. I know, young Midoriya is absurdly strong. All Might said. It's not that Midoriya just hurled that car without breaking a sweat Power Loader said, pulling out his hair from under his helmet. How is that a problem? Thirteen asked, confused at the support teacher's words. Our loader, still shaking, pointed at the scene, at the car Izuku hurled with one hand to be exact. That car he just threw is a Conquest Knight XV, which weighs about 13,000 pounds. He said, causing another wave of silence to cover the room, minus the cackling of Nezu. If Midoriya can throw a 13,000 pound car with half his quirk. Imagine what he can do without those limiters. They thought as they shivered and thanked whatever deity that made Izuku be on their side. Note to self, don't pissed off young Midoriya problem child. All Might and Azawa thought simultaneously. I don't know, that's kinda hot. Midnight said, before flinching backwards as Nezu sprayed her with water. Twenty minutes left present Mick's voice echoed in the area, making him blink. All of that happened in just fifteen minutes. Were the thoughts of every class 1A student, including Izuku. He saw his melee classmates nod to each other as they charged him. Anik entered his mind as he tried to push himself up, only for him to fall. He cursed in his mind. He could feel his classmates' footsteps getting closer. It frustrated him. Looks like I can't win against all my classmates, they're all coordinated like a pack of wolves. Those words made his eyes widen when he remembered something. Pack. He whispered as he smirked. Raising his head, he stared at his classmates charging him. His eyes turned red as he opened his mouth and let out a dark chuckle before turning serious as he took a deep breath. The rest of the class watched as Izuku took a deep breath. They were confused by this when... Grahhh he let out a deafening roar, a shockwave sent the charging students and some debris flying away. Kyoka and Shoji were forced to cover their ears due to their enhanced hearing. Itsuki and the others landed on the ground, albeit slightly shaken by the loud roar. They looked over to their class rep's direction only to close their eyes, as a dust cloud erupted in front of him, as if something heavy landed near him. 21 against 1 seems unfair, isn't it? Izuku said in the dust cloud. Let's fix that. He said ominously, sending chills in his classmates' spines. 
As the dust cloud slowly dissipated, the class and the viewers were shocked to see Mercer, now standing up and being flanked by his brawlers and hunters, growling and scratching the ground. The class began sweating profusely as Mercer raised his left arm and touched one of his hunters. Without a word, he consumed the creature and took a breath of relief. Smirking as his sclera turned black, further emphasizing the crimson glow of his arises. Now. How about round two? Mercer said, causing the creatures with him to roar as they charged forward. Let me know in the comments below if you guys want the next part. Also check out my other video that has been shown and left. Thank you for watching, if you enjoyed this video please like and share this video. And have a fantastic day bye.